Welcome to Industry Experts Explore the Future of Building, moderated by John Summers. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, I guess as expected, the crowd's a little smaller than it was this morning for Steve Wozniak, but if you want to come a little closer, feel free to do that. A uh, little interactive session here a little bit. So just to give everybody like kind of a level set of what we're doing here, I'm going to kick this off, talk about who AEM is, the future of building white paper that we released. And then I'm going to have a couple folks, uh, Aviad, who you saw this morning, and then um, Ray come up on stage, and we're going to have just basically a discussion for the last about 45 minutes of this, talking about these trends and the things you can anticipate to see that'll impact the industry over the next 10 years. So um, with that, thanks for being here. Let's get started. So who are we and who am I? Um, so AEM is the Association of Equipment Manufacturers. So we're a trade association. We have roughly about 1,000 members. Uh, we cover five off-road industry sectors. So agriculture, forestry, construction, mining, and utility. Um, Trimble is a member, as is, as is Volvo, who will be talking here in a little bit. So um, as a normal trade association, you know, do a lot of things. Have an office in Washington, D.C., working on advocacy efforts. Uh, market information, but what some of you will probably really know us for is we also own and run the Con Expo Con Ag trade show in Las Vegas that's coming up next March, um, as well as a utility expo in Louisville. Um, so those are kind of our you know end customer facing events. Uh, everything else we do, you know, we do for our members, which are whole good equipment providers um, and component suppliers, and then as well as services uh, companies that do services to the industry. And then me, um, I guess this panel is uh, industry experts. I don't know if I really fall into that, so you'll be hearing from those guys a lot in a little bit. But um, I'm John. Um, I'm our vice president of our construction and utility sector at AEM. I've been with the organization a little over 15 years, uh, started our marketing area, and then moved into kind of the industry subject matter expert, if you will, um, trying to help our members and, in turn, their customers, you, uh, be more successful and create efficiencies in their business. So. I'm responsible for the, the direction of the membership under our CE sector, we call it. So AEM has a lot of different um, committees that work on a lot of different things, some on safety standards, some on uh, market data information, and one of those uh, committees that we have is what we call the Futures Council. So this is, a, this is a group of folks that are tasked with understanding the trends that are impacting the industry and you know, where AEM as an association can help and then maybe where they could work together to educate their customers on things that they can anticipate seeing. Um, so we put together two teams um, underneath the Futures Council. One was called the Future of Food and one was called the Future of Building. So today we're here to talk about the Future of Building. Um, so this team got together and over multiple meetings basically just had open dialogue, open conversations about technology that's starting to impact the industry and um, the ways that customers are changing the way that they do business, basically. Um, so after all of this, they, they got together and we used this strategy that was developed by the Institute for the Future. They came up with, I think it was about 30 to 35 to 40 different things um, that they might see in the industry over time, and then we whittled that down to these 10. So some of the things that we kind of pushed out were like, 3D printing of buildings, you know, some of the stuff that might not really be mainstream in the next 10 years. Um, we tried to focus on what is either currently existing in the marketplace that you'll see increase over time, or the things that'll really become, start to become mainstream in that probably five to 10, 10 year area. So um, on the next few slides, you'll see uh, like sketch notes. Um, so these were ones that we had a graphic artist do during these meetings and kind of sketched out all the thoughts of the different people. So I'm going to walk through the 10 trends, and then we'll have the conversation. So future of building, like I said, um, it's the analysis of the 10 key trends that could dramatically change the way construction companies operate in North America. And there they are. So I'll walk through these one at a time, but we'll just, we'll just talk about them really here really quickly. So the reduction of carbon-based fuels, um, the development, and I guess the build-out of renewable energy generation sites. Um, compact equipment, um, there's a battery there, so it's compact equipment trending electric is the actual trend. You know, it could be all the alternative fuels. We'll get into hydrogen a little bit too. Um, connectivity, which is basically the enabler for everything that happens. Um, autonomous machinery, which unfortunately the offsite thing is, is not open today, but tomorrow you'll see some of that in, in action. 
sensors. This could be sensors on equipment or just on the job site. Uh, workers, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Business models is kind of that um, equipment as a service, or I think it was platform as a service, um, either Aviat or uh, um, they talked about this morning. Uh, construction data revealing its true value, and then cybersecurity. So just going through these one at a time, there's some kind of cool stats in these slides. I won't read these, but we'll just touch on these briefly. Um, the increased regulation of carbon-based fuels. So if any of you are doing work in California, you're probably familiar with CARB, the California Air Resources uh, Board, which is trying to you know, basically come up with like a tier five, um, get those emissions from off-road equipment down. Um, this really kind of plays into why some of the equipment is, is trending to electric or alternative power sources. Uh, and this is gonna be hitting our industry pretty significantly. I mean, you can kind of see it on on-road already. The next one kind of applies to technology, but it's more of that development of renewable energy sites. So think solar farms, um, wind farms, everything like that. The construction industry is gonna be key to this. Um, we had a committee talk a few years ago and all the transmission and you know, distribution lines that are put in are pretty much gonna be the same, but where they're pulling that power from is gonna change. So it's really up to the um, construction companies to really do this build out and do it efficiently. The other thing we always talk about is, you know, you can't really say anything zero emission, like a car or, or a mini excavator, because it depends on where that energy comes from. So if you, and how you charge it, right? So if you fire up your coal plant, it's not zero emission, it's zero tailpipe emission, but until you get to generating that energy from a renewable source, it's not truly zero emission. So I think we'll get down to that stage as well. Um, third piece of this, or third trend, is compact equipment trending electric. So you can see some hand tools in the screen here. I always kind of do the question of, does anybody have a corded drill, like at home? And if you do, do you use it? Um, pretty much everything's gone battery, right? Um, either your DeWalt or Milwaukee, you know, M18 batteries. So let's see the same thing with equipment over time. Obviously, it's gonna start with the smaller, compact stuff um, that may not need to run all day or the battery doesn't need to be huge but this really will also then go into other alternative fuel sources like hydrogen or uh, low, self or, um, low carbon fuels. Uh, connectivity, I mentioned this before, so this is really the enabler. Um, I know this was talked about in one of the opening sessions today. I, in my mind, there's three different key things to connectivity. That is either you have connectivity or not. So we talk about like rural broadband and there's a lot of different studies out there, but I know one of them says that about 25% of people in America do not have access to high-speed internet. So think about doing a job in a remote area, how are you getting connectivity to your equipment? So that's a big necessity that is, over, that is coming over time. The other, the second piece of that is the, um, the, the um, reliance of it, right? So like the, the reliability, sorry. So like if that data is, is kind of intermittent or you're losing in dead spots, it doesn't become as valuable. And then the third piece of that is the speed. So obviously that broadband, as things get faster, you know, doing things in the cloud and everything like that, it'll, it'll become more important to have that high speed connection. Uh, pathway towards autonomous equipment, I mentioned this before. Um, obviously autonomous equipment needs that connectivity to really work um, as there's the worker shortage everything kind of going on, we need to be able to do more with less. I think like everybody that's been on stage has said that already today. Um, so we, there was a mention this morning of one person basically managing a fleet of autonomous equipment instead of having to have an operator in that. That's one advantage. The other thing is taking those people out of, you know, dangerous um, or, you know, um, dirty situations. And then the third piece of that is Having an operator, um, you know, like the, maybe not fully autonomous, but automating features, having an operator, an unskilled operator be better. Sensors, um, I mentioned this can be sensors on people, on equipment. Um, once the other folks get on stage here, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but as we move from, um, you know, like sensors just understanding like equipment maintenance into actually productivity, there's one piece of that, and then sensors on, the, on people um, and on a job site, this moves past um, the just awareness and proximity sensors on equipment. It's, it's more into workflow and efficiency improvements. Fewer workers, I kind of mentioned this already. Um, there's, you can read that stat there, 41%. I, that's pretty much all the baby boomers will retire by 2031. 
think we're already short a lot of people in this industry to work, so um, we're gonna figure out how to do more, but it's not just the need for fewer workers, it's that the people that are working need to have a different skill set. So the other thing on the slide here is you know, putting a joystick in somebody's hand um, instead of a shovel, so it's helping that younger generation understand that this industry is really technologically advanced, and they can do things, everybody's used to playing video games they grow up, right? So it's like the different mindset of what a worker can do. I just walked through the uh, expo over there earlier and I saw the CAT Command Center, you know, operating the excavator that's in Arizona. So the remote work of that kind of gets into that autonomous piece of it, but it's also that different skill set. <clears throat> Business model shift. Mentioned this before a little bit, you know, as a platform as a service, equipment as a service, there's a couple different reasons for this, and I don't know if we'll talk too much about this today, but, you know, it's taking that CapEx off the front end, right? So it's having that thing as a subscription. So think about maybe when you had your iPhone, we'll say iPhone because we had a little Apple historian here this morning, right? So when you used to buy that, you'd pay that $1,000 up front, and now basically that's spread out over your two-year contract, so you pay $35 a month or whatever that comes out to. So it's kind of the same idea with equipment there, with technology, always getting like the newest technology or um, product in your hands while you have that subscription. Um, and it also could encompass all of the maintenance and service as well. Construction data, usually when we say construction data, I think everybody kind of thinks of like the telematics data coming off equipment. Um, a lot of times in the past that was more of the diagnostic, you know, even like where's my equipment, how much fuel do I have left, what needs maintenance. This is going to move more into the operational and production data. You could either tie this back to an operator and say, hey, we need to do some, you know, training to help this person be more efficient. Um, otherwise, it is the whole workflow of the job site. And cybersecurity, uh, you probably heard a couple times today, you know, moving stuff to the cloud, that, that, that security is not, you know, in your hand. It's, it's funny because, you, you know, you walk around the casinos here and think about how much cash somebody has on them. That's a little less secure than if the cash is in the bank, right? So think about that with your data. If you have it on site or in your office, you know, on a server there, it just is a little bit more vulnerable than moving into the cloud. But cybersecurity is one of those topics that's, Kind of hard to have a conversation on. Um, you know, you got to think of like, you need stuff secure, you don't want anybody accessing it. It's more, um, you know, having things at a distributed area um, as opposed to, to locally. The other piece of this is, um, you know, companies will just need to continually invest in that. If you look on there, the, uh, the new Infrastructure and Jobs Act, uh, federal government's allocated a billion dollars of the 1.2 trillion infrastructure fund towards cybersecurity. So this also gets into you know, um, critical infrastructure security, um, like there was that pipeline that got hacked a few months ago, as well as if all machines are connected, you don't want somebody to access those and gain control of them um, remotely um, for malicious intent. So a lot of different pieces to this, um, but cybersecurity is, is kind of one of the foundation pieces of this going forward as well. So with that said, I kind of went over the 10 trends, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll bring the other folks up on stage here in a second and kind of dive more into this and hear what they're seeing with this. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank our sponsors for this project, uh, Trimble and uh, Volvo Construction Equipment. Um, I encourage you all to download this white paper. I just breezed over this in about 15 minutes. There's a lot more text in here. Uh, you can go to aem.org slash insights or, or scan the QR code on the screen there. Um, the plan for the Futures Council is now to kind of understand what we can do as an industry to help their customers, the end users, move towards these trends and help them become a reality and what we can do to work together to do that. So with that said, I'd like to welcome uh, Aviad and Ray to the stage. How are you guys doing? Good, Good so far? Actually, great summer. I'm not sure we have anything to add, so. <laughs> <laughs> and we're done. 10 seconds left in the timer, we can probably. Yeah, um, yeah so thanks for joining me, guys. Um, why don't we just kind of go down here, Aviad, I'll let you introduce yourself. They might know you from earlier this morning, but a little, a little bit of your background. Sure, Aviad Almagor. I'm uh, leading the innovation at Trimble. Uh, I'm an architect by profession, so not an engineer, which is uh, quite tough in, a, in an engineering company. 
um, but that's why I have the kind of opportunity to dream a bit. Uh, I was actually uh, interested in this 3D printing stuff, but those guys thought <laughs> it's, not, it's not relevant for us for now. Let's wait with it a few more years. Uh, I joined Trimble about 10 years ago as, about, uh, as part of an acquisition, and since then I'm actually engaged with uh, emerging technologies and uh, making sure we identifying them early <coughs> and taking them into a journey till they are mature enough to be attractive for the business. Andre? Uh, Dr. Ray Gallant, I'm the Vice President Product Management and Productivity with Volvo Construction Equipment. I joined Volvo in 1994, so I'll let you figure out how many years ago that was. Um, originally Canadian, I am an engineer by trade, uh, so I've been working in product development and product plan planning and positioning uh, most of my career. And now I'm moving into the sphere of future casting and looking at new technologies and where the industry is going. And it's a very exciting, uh, very interesting spot to be at this point in my career. Yeah, so I like that quote earlier today, and I've heard that a few times, is, you know, innovation is moving faster now than it ever has before, but it'll never move this slow again, right? So it's interesting when we did that project, and I think that was started, it's probably been about two years now since I think we initially kicked off the Futures Council and the vision teams, which both, both of these guys were, were part of. And I, you know, thinking about what these trends were, they're all still relevant, but we're further down the path in a couple of them than when we started this conversation, right? So. Um, as we did this, we looped them, or grouped them, sorry, into three different sections. Uh, the first one is environmentally driven transformation. So we'll just kind of work our way through the 10 trends here. We'll focus on a few things. Um, I think one thing we need to kind of level set on here in the beginning of this is, you know, Elon Musk and Tesla were, were mentioned earlier in kind of the, the movement. And Ray, you just mentioned backstage, you have an electric car, right? So kind of moving towards that on on-road, and there's reasons for that. And, and I don't know, I'll take these words that you said before, it's kind of like, yeah, the environment, but it's super fun to drive, right? But in, in business, it's a little bit different because the fun might not make you any more money or make you more efficient. So if we take a look at like why this is happening in the off-road industry, I think there's a couple different reasons. Um, one of these is, is regulations that are driving this down. So Ray, do you want to talk about that and kind of other things that are driving the, I'll say the pull away from internal combustion engines a little bit? Yeah, I think the uh, regulations you mentioned earlier that uh, California especially is moving very quickly into more uh, stringent regulations against high carbon fuels. So, um, and we're seeing that trend across the country and in fact internationally as well. So that's something that's here to stay. It's not going to go back to allowing high, car high carbon fuels. So that's something we have to deal with. Um, we don't see the regulatory environment changing much from where it is today. It's going to continue to drive in this direction. But at this point, it's really up to us as an industry to develop solutions that meet those regulations. So it's not a matter of there's new targets going to be appearing every two years. We don't think it's more a matter of, okay, here's the gradual steps, here's the the phases that we have to go through to make this transition and make it in a reasonable way. Um, I keep talking about sustainability in these presentations being a balance between social sustainability, environmental sustainability, and economic sustainability. And it's good that we're now looking at those three and keeping them in balance. So that gives companies a, a chance to develop these technologies in an economically viable way. Uh, to meet the, the ambitions going forward. Yeah, and maybe to add to this, we, we do feel there's this regu regulatory pressure, of course, um, but I think there is another direction here. We, we see the young generation, the employees, demanding this. They want to feel that they work in a company that is doing good to the environment, and they want to see actual development which is aligned with their vision and with their kind of uh, way of life and with their future. So. Uh, we certainly see the pressure coming from the, the regulatory kind of organization, but also coming from the inside the company, uh, asking the management to, to commit to, to green um, energy. Yeah, so I think there's the, the ESG goals, right? Environmental, environmental sustainability and governance, right? And I think that you know, each company is working on implementing those into their internal operations. So that might be 
you know, at the manufacturing facility, we're going to reduce water by 20% or whatever that would be, right? But it's also that end use product. And then the contractor's also worrying about how we're going to reduce carbon output and everything like that. So, yeah, Ray, you made a point of, you know, you don't see this changing. You know, we kind of got that question at, at AEM a while ago of, hey, you know, we're midterm elections now. What's going to happen in a couple of years if Biden's out or, you know, if they're going to change? Where's this going to go? Right, and I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. I think Ray, you kind of said it before. It's like we don't see this changing. Like everybody's kind of embracing this whole thing, right? Yeah, I think that's true. And uh, there will be setbacks. There will be technologies that we see a lot of promise in today that may not prove out. There, there will be a constant evolution towards the right technologies in the right spot for the right economic formula. But um, I don't see it going backwards regardless of the political changes. That right. may uh, put a speed bump in the way, but that'll, that's just what it is. It'll be a speed bump on the path to a more sustainable footprint. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and I think there is another aspect here. So green technology is still, and green energy is still energy. So in, in addition to the move to electricity in this case, a Trimble at least, but I also I think in Volvo and other partners of the AEM, we invest quite a lot in optimizing the processes. So even if this is an, an electrical tool, we want to make sure that it is fully optimized to the mission in order to save energy, whether it's electrical or um, combustion engine or whatever. And I think Waz made a good point this morning that energy and the economy are tied together, and I do believe that, and that's where energy management is such a key component of this thing. It's not just about electrifying or hydrogen fuel cells or uh, low carbon fuels. It's about energy management in the entire site and the entire cycle that we're looking at. And that's what's going to drive the efficiency, the productivity, the, the comfort, the safety, everything else builds around that. Yeah, so a lot of this conversation kind of has in, that we've been having, but I think just in general, is kind of you know moving away from internal combustion from diesel, right? But I mean, even if you have that engine and you you know incorporate some technology in that, it, it's kind of like if you don't do the rework, you just burn that much less fuel, right? I mean, it's it, you know you talk about hitting environmental goals, you know everybody kind of just says, okay, we need to remove tailpipe emissions. Like that's not always the answer, right? I mean, it's it's like being efficient in other workflows and everything like that kind of can also help with that. And I think we need to recognize that over the last 20 years, with all the EPA regulations that came in, the, the greenhouse gas is down by over 90% right. out of con internal combustion. So that path will continue as well uh, in areas where we can't take out the diesel necessarily and replace it with a zero emission uh, engine immediately. Or the way to do that then would be to tow a diesel generator out to charge your electric thing, right? And you're defeating the purpose, so yeah. Let's not. <laughs> um, so I think we can kind of move on to that. You know, we talked about there are some challenges that are kind of on that point of like how do you refuel this, whether that's um, re recharging the battery or getting the hydrogen out to the site, but there are advantages, you know, of things going electric as well, right? So I think this will kind of take us into section two of this which, you know, we'll, we'll kind of skip connectivity here for a second, but as we get into like autonomous equipment, as you remove kind of the mechanical controls and, you know, you know hydraulics become electrohydraulic and to get more precision control, that also helps us to kind of enable autonomy and precision controls, right, Avian? Yeah, obviously, yes. I, I think there are additional benefits to the, to the move to uh, electrical engines. Uh, first, maintenance. Maintenance cost goes down dramatically when you deal with uh, electrical engines. Um, for the benefit of the customer, that's, that's a huge advantage. Um, I think noise. Noise is, is a, you know, noise is this type of pollution and actually a quite painful uh, aspect of construction work which impact all the neighboring environment. Uh, so even on the regulatory aspect, noise is a challenge and once we move to uh, electrical engines, we can help solve this uh, um, uh, pain uh, that we're experiencing today. And I think the third aspect is, is with the electrical shift, it's more tuned to this digital transformation processes that we are going through. Connecting this machine as electrical machine compared to mechanical machines 
to the kind of ecosystem of a digital environment is much easier and more tuned to this type of uh, inputs that we would like to get. So I think with those controls, maybe, maybe we take a step back here and, and define this, because I always kind of try to separate, you know, automated features versus autonomous, right? So I think we're, we're, I mean, you guys are showcasing some autonomous equipment out there, but I don't, that's been used in mining for a while. I think Ray, you, yep. you know, Volvo did the, the project with the haul trucks running autonomously Electric as well, site. right? So yep. I mean, I think in that closed environment, you know, specific use cases, we could get to fully autonomous machines, right? But but let's take a step back and just kind of talk about automation for a second, right? So with that, it's kind of, you know, there's the, the saying of, you know, making a okay operator great and an inner-experienced operator better, right? So let's talk about that and kind of how that ties into to connectivity and kind of what's needed for that technology. And I think that there's a full spectrum of different things. When you talk about autonomy or making machines autonomous, there's a whole spectrum of different levels of that we can do. And we're all familiar with our cars having cruise control and now adaptive cruise control. Those are simple automation steps that we can put in machines and help the operator be better operators. And it also talks to what the new generation are looking for. Um, you mentioned earlier that they're coming in looking for us to provide a purpose through these ESG and sustainability goals that's a purpose why they're coming to work for us. Same thing with autonomy. When you build a machine that works off joysticks, works off electro-hydraulic controls, the newer generation, the newer operators are much more comfortable with that because that's a, a control method they're used to. Uh, and they've had on the video games, they've had on TV remote controls, everything else. So they're very used to that. And even to the point of tele-remote operation, uh, they're much more adapted to that and are looking for that from us. So it takes them out of dirty, dangerous environments or even repetitious, boring environments and puts them into a more um, conducive, healthy, safe workplace. Yeah, and I think that um, kind of partial autonomy can help us with a challenge to get experienced operators. Uh, if we can help uh, an unexperienced operator with semi-autonomy processes is bring us much faster to the productivity level we want to be at. Uh, that's one aspect of this kind of uh, semi-automation. Uh, I think we, we saw great success in, in the uh, remote operation aspect. Uh, again, as a kind of an intermediate solution between full autonomy and where we are today. If I can control a machine from remote, and we tested it with small machines, you guys probably tested it with big machines, um, you saw Spot Robot. We can control this robot today from anywhere in the world. You can sit uh, here in, in uh, um, Las Vegas and control a robot in New Zealand. We did it, it's working. Actually, our customers, some of them are already using this technology with 5G, we'll talk about connectivity in a second. So it's really about bridging this kind of a gap between today and the future where everything will be fully automated. In the meantime, we can certainly benefit from those um, um, capabilities. And, and the final point on that, I think with the electro-hydraulic connected machines and the autonomous, you do open up new operations, new applications that we can't do today mm. with human operators. So you have a machine that's very precisely controlled from a location point of view. You can have two haulers passing within inches of each other, which you'd never do with human operators. But with an autonomous machine, you can do that. You can run that regularly. Or you can hook them together and do a train under a conveyor belt. So do continuous loading, which normal operations, you would have a loader and a hauler, separate units, and you'd haul, load it and then haul it away. Now we can do a continuous train, if you will, under a conveyor belt, and it's a much more efficient loading method. Interesting. That's kind of like, you know, in the on-road, there's the pl platooning, right, where it's, you have yep. a driver in the first vehicle that's in full control, and then everything else is kind of following that movement. Is that kind of the same, similar idea there with that continuous path of haulers kind of Similar, going but it, it's the communication between machines mm. and between the loading sites and the, the conveyor in this case that makes that possible. Interesting. Which also an opportunity from the technology point of view, not all the machines should be equal. I mean, the, the machine that guides this kind of operation should have all the sensor, all the spatial awareness, 
but then the followers can just have you know the ability to follow. That's what they right. need to do, and, and it's kind of help us reduce the cost of those machines. So, Javier, you mentioned connectivity, and you know I kind of I skipped over that one, even though it probably could have been the first one we talk about, right? Because I think this is kind of the enabler for almost all of these trends, and I mean even cybersecurity falls into that, you know, at the end here. So. Um, you mentioned the, the project in New Zealand, I think you just said 5G. I mean, there's that, there's that latency of, or the low, much lower latency of 5G, right? And then there's that reliable connection and all of that. So do you wanna just talk about that and kind of where that's needed and where maybe things can be done locally and not get off site versus, yeah. yeah. Sure, so, so um, on high level connectivity is a key for almost everything we're doing. Actually, it's some sort of a hidden technology. If it's working, everyone is happy. If it's not working, nothing will work. Uh, from uh, operating machines, uh, you know, getting uh, data from sensors on site, monitoring activities, everything relies on, the, on communication today. And we do have more options. We have, as you heard earlier today, this in the morning, we have uh, um, uh, options to pick from and, and uh, much uh, um, higher bandwidths, but. We also have you know, private 5G networks, for example. That's the, the, the use case I mentioned with, with a spot robot uh, was used by BAM in one of the islands where they operate uh, a project, and they were using private 5G to control the robot in this specific area, which is critical for us in remote um, scenarios and construction and ag in many cases are in remote areas where connectivity is not necessarily uh, available. So certainly this is an option. Low orbit satellites is another option. We're, we are looking for a variety of solutions, and at the end of the day, potentially the solution will be a hybrid solution, which enables the machine to kind of reconnect to different system based on the available uh, bandwidth and the available connectivity. That's the way we see it today. And as we get better at designing the sites, that also helps with that, because as you said, we can have a, a master machine, if you will, communicating with the other machines on site and guiding the other machines. So we don't necessarily have to beam everything, all the information back every time from every machine. But that is, a, again, a learning curve, something that we've got to explore and get much better at how we set up the sites and how we manage the sites. So it's basically like setting up a local area network, right, and, and maybe having a master machine or something like that. And all the guidance information plans for the site basically just feed into that and you only send up what you need to do, right? right. Or maybe it's a one-time end of the day, if it's you know hours put on a machine, if somebody's not gonna monitor that all day long, why do you need to throw that in the cloud all right. the time, if, right? If you have a very repetitious haul road, for instance, all mm -hmm. you need to know is if something goes wrong and the hauler's off track. Right. Yeah. But, Other but, than that, it can work, run by itself. But practically what we are looking for is uh, a good edge computing solution which can really handle the day-to-day -day activity or the hourly activity, and then the, the cloud infrastructure where you have good connection, you upload to the cloud. The, especially with autonomous machine, you cannot just rely on this kind of far edge or the cloud solution which provides you the solution. You, might, you, you must have something on the machine that can handle the kind of dynamic environment the, the, the machine is active in. Um, now, there is, there is some conflict here because when you introduce a new technology with a better bandwidth, quite soon we find the customers want to, do, to upload more data. And you, you know, it's kind of, you, you're always chasing the, the, the use cases and trying to fulfill the, the, the needs. But obviously, the more we provide communication, the more it would be used. I you know that's one thing that AEM's team in, in Washington, D.C. has been advocating for is I mentioned this in the, in the opening, the rural broadband, right? So that getting that connectivity to whether it's farmers in a remote site or remote job site, and I think the, the, the piece of that is, I think typically in your home now, if you have a fairly normal you know, cable internet connection, I think you're 10 meg up, right? And I think this is pushing for 100, right? So I think it's the ability also to get that data off the site, the stuff that needs to be due, especially if it's a critical you know, fault, right? Like you mentioned, right? I mean, the, the speed of, getting that to the cloud, getting it back down to somebody's, whether it's their phone or whatever like that, is alert them in real time, you know, so you can make a actionable decision as opposed to hearing about it the next day, right? Yeah. 
So I think that kind of takes us into sensors, right? I mean, we, a sensor, anything's a sensor almost, right? So I mean, you can put sensors on a lot of things. I think when people think about this with equipment, at least my mind, I either go towards, you know, location or, you know, fuel burn, or if you think about sensors and that, it's like proximity sensor, you know, you're backing up your truck and it beeps before you hit something like that. Let's, let's kind of talk about what other sensors could exist in the future, maybe what are coming in. Avia, you want to kick this one off? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a huge topic. Um, Samsung could do so much for us from safety aspects, monitoring the environment and the tool itself and the operator, um, efficiency, helping us to optimize processes, understand what's the impact of the machine on site and react to this um, collaboration between multiple machines. So a fleet of autonomous machines can work together using sensors. And I'm saying sensor, but of course it's a broader sense of sensor gets the data. We need an edge device or a cloud to kind of take all this data together and optimize it in order to really uh, fulfill our goal here. And we can talk much more about that, you know. It's, uh, well, here I think it, to go the one, one step further, the, the sensors basically are gathering data that we're using and trying to use more and more intelligently to control and help the site. But if you take it right back to the, the basics, sensors can gather a lot of different data. And what you have in a machine now is a data access point on that site. And if you take millions and millions of machines around the world, if we enable all those data access points, you could see a, a huge network that we could start using in the future for things that aren't necessarily site related. So if you want to get better weather forecasting, you have a million nodes where you can easily get ambient temperature to come up through the cloud and be used in weather. And that gets into monetizing that sensor data that we talked about in the Futures Council. Yeah. It's much more than what we need to run the operation or run the machine efficiently. It's this is a data gathering hub, and our challenge is how do we smartly use that data for any number of applications. Yeah. Think about you know, predictive and prescriptive processes. Just by getting these millions of inputs, I can tell by the noise from the machine, from the engine, what's the health and, and when will be the next maintenance required. So it, it's, it's a really a completely transforming the way we'll, we'll handle those uh, machines and the interaction of the machine with the environment. I think that's one of the key things you can see on a slide here, that the artificial intelligence kind of being intertwined with everything, right? I think we need so much data to understand what's really going on. There was a story I heard one time about um, somebody had a, you know, a um, sensor go off and the engine was overheating, right? And the sensor was saying, engine's hot, engine's hot. Well, they were working in Texas in the summer, so of course it was throwing that thing. And then they had the same machine in Alaska working and they got the same thing and they were like, okay, this is probably actually a problem, right? Because they, you have all that other data, but that's somebody, you know, looking at that themselves. If we can do that through AI and kind of like predict all of that stuff and then you get into the predictive, prescriptive, maybe we should define that, right? Yeah. So, so currently I think we're doing, primarily the industry is doing preventative maintenance, right? So you have your 500 hour interval and you're scheduling it and you're doing that. What, what kind of comes next? So to, to me, the next step is the, the prognostics, looking ahead and saying, okay, a population of a million machines around the world we know that statistically speaking, this is the life. So right now we do an engineering life estimate on every component on the machine and we say, you know, between 12 and 14,000 hours, 10% of them will fail. The problem is that when they fail, quite often they fail catastrophically. So the data will allow us to, one, refine those estimates so we know it's not 10% that'll fail in 12 to 14 hours, it's 4% in 13,500 hours. Mm -hmm. Then we can start to look and say, okay, what's the balance between predictive maintenance teardowns and rebuilds and letting it go to failure? And where does that make sense to go forward? And we could start doing the same thing with production. So as machines age, of course, you don't have the same production rates as you would even things like toothware. You can start to monitor the fill factors on buckets and find out that you're, okay, your tooth are worn, your teeth are worn, 
and therefore the loader is not able to as efficiently penetrate the pile and pick up a load. So your fill factors are dropping. The machines can start telling you that. The data can tell you that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting because what we hear from customers in many cases recently, it's not about the amount of data that they can collect. It's about what can we do with this data? So we have the data. Sensors are easy to put today. It's not, it's not a challenge anymore. The challenge is how to get something meaningful out of the data that we yep. collect. That's, that's where we should focus. And maybe one more note about sensors. We, we don't need just to look inside. There is an opportunity here because those machines are in the field 24-7, and they can collect so much data about what's going on on the site, which is not necessarily related to their specific activity. It relates to the site operations. A crane or, or a truck or a dozer, excavator, they all the time in this environment and can provide us so much input about what's going on, which is highly valuable to the customers. So I think Part of this conversation transitioned into section three here, which is the transforming our business. This really gets into the data in the industry and using it, you know, to the advantage. So, I mean, we'll skip around here a little bit, but you know, that construction data piece, let's just keep focusing on that. I think, you know, you talked about like the production and the teeth wear, tooth wear, and everything like that. I think there's also the piece of it of, you know, if, there's a story that comes to mind. I remember there was, there was a story about an operation that was running wheel loaders, and they looked at the average daily speed run, and I think it was 11 miles an hour, 8 miles an hour, whatever it was, right? And they were going through tires because everybody was taking the corner too fast, and they said, hey, the, the trucks that are running at 6 miles an hour every day, those tires are lasting twice as long as the other ones. Let's slow down. Maybe we'll, we'll move the load a little bit slower, but the operating cost will be less because you're not replacing however much a tire on a big wheel loader is, right? Uh, you know, every couple months, right? So like kind of what are some other examples of that? I think when we think of construction data, a lot of times, I've said this before, but you know, you think of location, operating hours, it's a lot of that diagnostic data. I think there's a lot more that we can get into um, that's more of the operational understanding the site orchestration, right? And again, you look at an entire site, uh, one of the things a hauler operator is always scared of is he's going to be late getting to the load right. site and the excavator is waiting for him or the lo loader is waiting for him to get there. So what do they tend to do? They speed up, try to get there early, and invariably they're there for two or three minutes waiting for the truck ahead of them to be done and moving on its way. So now with these new technologies we have and with connecting all the machines on site, you see where the operator is and actually even the programs will tell you how quick, quickly to go whether to speed up or slow down. And of course, it, it, when you slow down, you burn less fuel, you have less tire wear, you have less wear and tear on the machine. So there's a lot of benefits like that. And it's not the operator's fault. He's doing what he uh, was told to do. Make sure you're there ready to load because we don't want the excavator or the loader sitting idle. But now we give him the information that says, okay, we can get that very precise. So we can have you pull up before the, or when the next truck is pulling out and not even have to stop. Just come to a rolling stop and the uh, loader will load you. Yeah. Um, you know, data clearly will help us optimize, all of us. But I think the other aspect of it, talking a bit on the, on the transformation on the business side, it is an opportunity to monetize data. I mean, the data that is collected by all of us, all the customers in the field, all the machines in the field can be monetized. It's, it's worth something. We can do with it something. Now, the interesting part here is that as a single entity, it's not very valuable. It provides something, but the value is limited. If I, I have uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 machines in the field, that's, that's OK, but the data is not enough to really generate value. But if I'm creating an ecosystem with those millions of machines in the field, and then I get the data, this is already an interesting opportunity. And the idea here will probably be some sort of collaboration between those individual organizations and a service provide, which can really make the meaning and bring it back to those customers to benefit from. So it's still you know, in the process of creation, but the business model is, is very interesting here. 
I think you know the, the whole interoperability of data and actually having it be actionable or shareable with the right people and everything like that also kind of enables that, right? I mean, it, it's kind of the, you know, the, the it, you have something and you might not know who that could be valuable to, right? Whether it's the as-built data or whatever it would be, but I think there is an opportunity to understand who else could benefit from that? I mean, Ray, you talked about the weather data before. I mean, if now if we have cranes in the field that have you know weather monitors on them, I mean, maybe that means you don't build them out somewhere else. And then we we're sharing that with other other folks. So I think we could kind of go back a little bit. Let's go. Let's go to the business models piece here. So um, Avi, if you want to talk about this a little bit, I know we we talked about, or I think it was either you or it was Rob in the beginning presentation. I forgot what the the Trimble platform as a service now, right? And kind of mm -hmm. you know. A little bit different than you know having that capex upfront and purchasing something. Um, it's having that subscription to that with all the service and everything comes with it. So you want to just touch on that? Yeah, we think it's a better fit for our customers. Uh, first, it's on the operation side. Secondly, it's providing the opportunity to scale easily and to shrink if needed because the, it's, it's you know it's not they don't own it; they just use it as needed and scale it when they need. So, I think this flexible model is. Highly suitable, of course, to the software industry, but we believe that also on the hardware side, and that's what we are uh, already doing with, with uh, some of our customers, also on the hardware side, there is a huge opportunity for this model of uh, uh, service. And I think the characteristics of electric machines and connectivity also play into that, because one of the things that we've noticed is with equipment as service or anything like that, we as manufacturers have to, or as the owners of the asset, have to be able to guarantee certain uptime rates because the, the customer is hiring productivity in that case. He's paying us to produce so many tons or to move so many tons of dirt in our case. So just the aspect of having everything connected, having a higher reliability rate on electric equipment, having the remote diagnostics that we can make sure that if that machine is getting into a problem, we have something else on site, or a mechanic there before it's catastrophic failure, is a big piece of this equipment and service, and one of the things we can take advantage of to make that a reliable model. So as you guys can see, you know, everything ties together here, right? So I mean, that, that brings it back to the AI doing the predictive maintenance and everything like that, because if you're paying you know, whether you're paying, you know, the monthly or whatever it would be to have that machine, you, it needs to be up all the time or you need to come swap it out, right? It, it reminds me of, I come from a marketing website background, right? So I remember, you know, when I was younger, it was, you know, all the web servers that would serve up your website, they all said like 99% guaranteed uptime, right? And it was always that you had to get to that point because otherwise what good is it to you, right? So I think it's, you know, with the equipment, it's kind of that same thing and understanding that. Uh, and how to, how to basically guarantee that if the customer's paying for it. Well, the, the famous Ted Levitt marketing quote, that the customer didn't buy a drill because yeah. he needed a drill, he needed a hole. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's what the customers are paying for and we have to keep that in mind. So I know we touched on workers a little bit before, kind of that changing, whether that's, you know, them working from, from their home on their couch, operating an excavator, you know, um, remotely, or if it's just a different type of person that, that is entering the job site. Do you guys have any real thoughts on that? I'm kind of aware of the, you know, typical operator or what kind of, you know, like education or um, experience, sorry, that person needs versus where they, what they might need in the future? Well, I think the, as we talked about, the skill set, I think, of these new machines, new technologies is more adaptable or is more, is picked up by the newer generations of yeah. workers. That, that's what they want to see, and they want to see that we have a purpose in doing that. It's not just an economic play, it's a sustainability play. It makes our world better. It makes a better world we want to live in. But beyond that, I, I also think that if you look at the demographics and what's happened over the last 100 years or so, we've gone from basically 70% Agri agrarian society where the food was grown locally, you consumed it locally, and only 30% of it was moved into the cities. Mm -hmm. Now we've basically flipped that around to the other side, where 30% of the people have to grow all the food and bring it to the cities for 70% of the population. So that changes the dynamic 
uh, appreciably for the jobs we're going to need because now 30% of the people are producing what used to be produced by 70% of the people for a population four or five times the size that it was at that time. Right, so right. it's not only what workers want, it's what we're going to need in the future to respond to that new demographic and new uh, way of living that we have. So I guess last but not least, and we'll, we'll, we'll save a few minutes here for questions if anybody has anything, if I can see anybody and if you raise your hand. Um, but cybersecurity, I know we touched on this a little bit, you know, moving that data from a local storage kind of into the cloud, you know, utilizing that, that, that security for that. I think that, um, you know, this just becomes paramount to everybody's business, all the critical infrastructure in the U.S. I mean, it's, it, it, there's unbelievable stats of how, much, how many attacks are on, you know, even small organizations. And it's like, who are, who are these people and what are they trying to gain access to? So uh, maybe you guys just have some, you know, thoughts on where this could go or how, you know, maybe small to medium-sized contractors could kind of, you know, help take that burden off themselves. I can start. So yeah, obviously, I mean, there's a, a big concern also on our side on the software. Uh, the more you are connected, the more you're exposed to threats. And um, it is happening, and we need to make sure our customers are protected. So an investment in cybersecurity is a must, especially when we start to deal with uh, uh, autonomous machines. You don't want to see an excavator, you know, uh, running in the streets and uh, uh, without control. So, um, yeah, it's a big topic, important topic, and we don't expect the kind of users, the customers, to handle it. It must be done and be fully embedded in our solutions. I think one of the challenges with cybersecurity is the same as the applications. So we're seeing new applications that we never thought of come out because of the advantages and the features of electric drives, for instance. I think we're going to see the same thing with cybersecurity. Like, we can guard and we know the potential of an autonomous machine being hacked and the problems that would cause, it's what I'm worried about is the things that we can't see coming. The unknown. You know, the malicious yeah. hacking attacks, the things that we don't necessarily see and that that's where the challenge in cybersecurity, in my opinion, is going to be. So any final thoughts while the audience prepares any questions? If anybody has anything, I mean, you know, Aviada kind of made a joke earlier of all those, all those future, future things, let's call them that, right, that we kind of remove from this because this is the stuff that will impact you in 10 years. So, so maybe we, final thoughts on this and then maybe some stuff that, you know, is the unknown that we haven't talked about yet? Want to start? Actually, if, what I would like to mention is, and this was a quite uh, exciting process, the, the work with AEM on this uh, report. It was interesting that, you know, they successfully brought in partners and competitors to work together to brainstorm and to you know, get to the core of those uh, uh, topics. And I think the outcome is, is reflecting this, this quality. So uh, really appreciate the work that AEM did to, to bring us together and forcing us to sit together and talk and work. And I think building on that, I think that also is part of the way of the future. So these unlike innovations in the past where maybe a company, an individual company or even an individual inventor had the knowledge and the core competence to, to build something and to promote it, um, now it's going to be more combinations of various companies working together. Even what we traditionally consider competitors right. will be working together to bring out these new technologies and no single company is going to be able to master all the core technologies going into these things. So I think, and again, that's very much a new way of working that the, the upcoming generations are comfortable with. And we've so we seen talk that, about the work sorry. differences, that's going to be part of it. I was going to say, and we've seen that obviously in consumer. I mean, back to, let's make another Apple comment here, as long as we're on that topic and a little bit today, right? I mean, when the iPhone opened up, you know, to all the app developers. I mean, just think about the value that that created, right? So it's it's if every, I'll, I'll say every company who's a member of AEM, you know, you do what you do really well and then help everybody else make the industry just succeed by working together. I think that's maybe is the, the, the kind of theme of this whole whole piece of this. So, so do we have any questions from the audience? About five minutes left. Yep, go ahead. 
I'll, re I'll repeat that. He asked, what risk do you guys see in the next five years? I think we, uh, we did speak about cybersecurity. I see that as one of the big risks. This is a, a new dimension, a new uh, area where we're connecting literally millions of data points and there's a lot of entry points that malicious um, en entities can enter. Uh, the other risk, I think we, there's such a thing as a Gardner hype cycle that when you're talking about new technologies where the expectations of a new technology in the beginning tend to be extremely high. And we know that most of those expectations are not met. It's a plateau at the end that's somewhat more muted than the initial expectations. And I think that's, that's part of the uh, risk as we take this journey that people are gonna think that these new technologies are a magic bullet and are gonna solve all our problems. And that's just not the way the world works. So I think there, we have to be patient, we have to be dedicated um, to it, but realize that it's going to take time and it is a transition. It's not gonna be something that we can do tomorrow. Yeah, I think that on the geopolitical side, actually, there is a challenge. We see this kind of change in trend uh, countries start to be isolated, we have supply chain challenges, um, not sharing technologies. I think this can be um, a risk for uh, advancing the technology of the industry. I mean, if we start to see this connection between the internet networks, between communication networks, this certainly brings some challenges to us in order to, uh, if we want to optimize processes around the globe. I might just add one thing to that. I, you know, from AEM's perspective, I think we look at regulations as just challenges and we hope that those don't um, hinder innovation, right? I mean, we, if we go all the way back to the beginning of this, right, we talked about engine emissions. If, if there is a regulating body that basically says, hey, anything this size of equipment needs to be battery electric, well, what if there's something better than that? It's like, don't pin us in a corner like let the industry kind of figure out what it is. Set your goals and let, you know, the intelligent people at Trimble and Volvo and all the other organizations kind of figure out the best path to get there, right? So I think, you know, from, from our perspective, we're always looking at all of those different things and trying to educate everybody to, to, to say, set the goal, but don't set the path, right? Right. Anything else? Yep, a couple right here. Oh, there's a couple, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, front row. You know, Trimble directly is not handling this. The project, but the technology we provide is certainly uh, helping with this specific mission. So optimizing processes, simulating processes, as we mentioned earlier this morning, the ability to understand the impact of a design on the environment and how it will impact in the, the environment in the future, how to handle specific disaster kind of uh, um, cases. So certainly the technology can help us handle those challenges. Uh, and help our customer build the right infrastructure. The one other piece of that, I think you know, we talked about sensors, we talked about sensors on a job site, but there's also the sensors on the infrastructure after it's built, right? So I don't remember how this works, but there's, there's three different ways to design buildings downtown in a city and one are, one's better for wind, one's better for rain, and it's like how do we get all those sensors and understand how that all works to design kind of quote unquote the perfect infrastructure, right? So I think that'll play into it. Yeah. I think somebody else, oh sorry, go ahead. That's a great point, so, so for example, just to clarify the, the technology, uh, Trimble uh, monitoring, it's a specific group inside Trimble dealing with monitoring uh, infrastructure, so it can be dams or, or, or um, any other strategic infrastructure which you need to make sure that any movement, any change in the structure is being documented and reported immediately, so that's part of the, of the work which is more related to is already build structures, uh, but certainly uh, critical for the health of those assets. Good question. I think there was another one right behind you somewhere. Go ahead. Yes, you, you mentioned uh, regulation as being a risk or an obstacle, which is pretty common, but then you also mentioned like California kind of driving some of the changes related to electric vehicles. Can you give some examples of regulation that you think is positive 
So the question was, um, you know, we mentioned California kind of driving emission levels down. Are there, are there, are there uh, regulations that could be setting a goal that it actually would have a positive impact on everything going forward, right? Is that, that? Sure. Yeah, so, I, do you wanna take this one, Ray? Yeah, I, I certainly, um, I think the regulations, and you hit on it, it, the regulations that set ambitions or targets uh, for industry to hit, I think are good, as long as those targets are realistic. Uh, the regulations that try to say how you're going to hit it are, are very tricky and very risky because they get into technologies that we don't even fully understand yet uh, as the people working with it. So to me, I kind of draw that line. I, I like when governments uh, put out regulations that standardize protocols, for instance, that give us targets to go after in the future. It gets very, very dicey when they start saying how you're going to do it in those types of regulation sets. And if I could just clarify my comment on that, right? I think it. I think it's good that we're setting these environmental, you know, emission goals. The challenge and where the risk is, if is if California says do this by 2026, right? So I think that's the risk. So I think from all of our perspective, we're trying to educate everybody to make sure that um, there's enough time and ways to test it for the equipment manufacturers and things are done correctly, because otherwise that just impacts the whole ecosystem, right? And that's the hype cycle that yeah. we get caught in, that they think that, okay, the technology's here, we can do it all by 2025. Okay, so we're, we're, o we're over a minute, but there's one more question here, go ahead. So, so the question was, how do you see the, the call it equipment as a service, right? The service-based business models on the heavy equipment versus the technology. I think that was basically right. Yeah, we're already seeing the equipment as a service rolled out in the heavy equipment as well, um, right up to, you know, mining sectors and some of the heavy construction sectors. It, it's a little bit different than a service model, uh, so it's a little bit different business model. It's not necessarily a subscription like you might see in a service model, but it's a way of paying for the equipment based on production, based on hours used, uh, based on something other than the financial capital cost. So that's really what's uh, attractive. Um, plus, like I said earlier, the uptime guarantees that usually go along with that are attractive to a lot of customers because then they can guarantee their production rate as well. If you know your machines are up 98% of the time, then you can pretty accurately predict your production rates. Excellent. Does that answer your question, sir? Yeah. So in the, I think there's going to be different models ev emerge here, but in the models that we're running, Volvo is running at the moment, uh, we own the capital asset. So we keep it on our books and we put it out to the customer's job, the contractor's job, and then he pays by the productivity or by the hour, however we have it set up. But the capital asset belongs to us. Okay, with that, I would like to thank Ray, Aviad, audience. Everybody, thanks for being here. Enjoy the rest of Dimensions in your week in Vegas. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much.